Morning. Good morning. Okay, I promised Pam that I, she said, I don't want to rush God, but is there any way you can be done by quarter to one? I said, yeah. So, <laughs> I think she said, man, quarter to twelve. Okay, today's passage in the sermon, if you turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be reading, starting off in verse 14. If you're using the Bibles in the pew, that's on page 869, I believe, if I'm reading my handwriting correctly. This is uh, <clears throat> the letter to the church of Laodicea. And as you're turning and finding your spot in your Bible, I'll give you a little bit of background about Laodicea. Okay? Um, Laodicea is a city... There in Asia Minor, it's located on crossroads of a trade route. It's a very wealthy city. Uh, has a very wealthy <laughs> banking industry there. In fact, uh, just to point it out to you, the Emperor Cicero wrote recommending the bank in Laodicea as a place to where to to cash your checks. Actually, it's, a, it's called the bank draft or the bank exchange, okay? It's a very wealthy bank. Very wealthy bank. Laodicea also is a very... Um, is this too loud for anybody? No? Okay. I, I, uh, Laodicea is also very rich with natural resources. It has also very rich natural resources with the exception of one, and that's water. Okay? So that's just a little bit of background on Laodicea. And this all comes into play with understanding our passage. So if everyone's there, let's start reading at verse 14. It says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one, or I wish you were... You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me, refine, to buy from me, gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see those whom I love I rebuke and discipline so be earnest and repent here I am I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door I will come in and eat with him and be with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He has, <clears throat> he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You bow with me, please. Father, we thank you for this, for this, your word. We pray that you take the truths of this word and that you as the author instill that truth in our hearts and to illumine our spirits we might rightly understand and apply this your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Has anyone ever been to Chuck E. Cheese? <laughs> Has anyone ever had a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese? Has anyone ever given their son a birthday party at Chuck E. Cheese? I haven't, okay? <laughs> I don't get real cynical a lot. Well, yeah, I do. But <clears throat> to me, Chuck E. Cheese is a racket. Okay, excuse me first. To me, Chuck E. Cheese is a racket. It's just a real racket. Especially the birthday parties, okay? You pay all this money for a birthday party to buy frozen pizza and have some guy in a mouse suit sing to you. 
It's a, it, oh, and then you get to, you know, spend $25 on playing games so you can get a 10 cent prize, right? <clears throat> it just doesn't make sense. Well, my oldest son had a birthday, and he was old enough to know what Chuck E. Cheese is. <clears throat> we asked him, said, what do you want to do on your birthday? Where do you want to go on your birthday? He said, Chuck E. Cheese. And we weren't real keen with that idea, but we talked about it and said, okay, we're going to take you to Chuck E. Cheese. You and your friends and your brother and sisters can play your games, get your cheap toys, and then we're coming back home for cake, ice cream, and we'll make real pizza, okay? But we're not going to have to do a party there. And he said he understood, <clears throat> so we went off to Chuck E. Cheese. Then after a while, I started looking around, where's Chris at? You know, I can't find our son anywhere. And we finally, so I'm looking around, I try to find him, and there he is yeah. in one of the party rooms yeah. <clears throat> where this little boy had a party, and his parents loved him enough to get him the real party instead of just taking him there for the make-believe party. And so there's the guy in the mouth suit singing happy birthday. And it was my son standing in with his biggest grin on his face in front of someone else's birthday cake. <clears throat> okay? Letting Chuck E. Cheese sing to him. <laughs> so I pulled him aside, got him out of the way, you know, apologized, got over my embarrassment. And, <clears throat> and I was explaining to him, this isn't your party. So well, yeah, it is. It's my birthday. <clears throat> it's my birthday. Yeah, but you know, that little boy's parents loved him enough to do all this. Yours, on the other hand, are taking you home for ice cream. You know? And he just couldn't get through his head. It was his birthday. Chuck E. Cheese was singing happy birthday. There's a birthday cake there. It must be for him. Okay? As I thought about that, <clears throat> as I was meditating on our passage this past week, I remembered that story and thought, you know that's what many of us do in today's fallen world. Everything's about us. Everything's about us. We become very self-centered. <clears throat> we become very dependent on ourselves. We, that the whole world revolves around us. In fact, isn't that what happened in the garden when it caused the fall? Didn't Satan say, you know, if you eat of this, then you will become as a god? You know, God made Adam and said, I'm going to give you dominion over everything. You are the steward of all creation except for that. Except for that one thing. And Adam said, no. I want that too. Okay, it's all going to revolve around me. Not everything except that. So I think that's something we all struggle with. That's something that the church in Laodicea struggled with. And that's what our passage <clears throat> highlights today, and I just want you to look for that as you're, as we go through this passage. Now, as we look through these churches, uh, something I didn't mention before, and I probably should have before I read it, you know, what we have here is we have a letter, it's in the book of Revelation, so it was written by John, i to try that again, book of Revelation, so it was written by John, okay, uh, and in that book, there are seven letters that Christ himself dictates <clears throat> to John for John to write to these seven churches. And that's what we're reading here. We're reading the last of those seven letters to the church of Laodicea. <clears throat> so as we start here, one thing to remember is it's written by Jesus. Okay? This is dictated by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's being written to a church. Okay? And that's important to remember. It's being written to a church. It's not being written to a believer. It's not being written to an unbeliever. It's being written to... It's not being written to a group of believers. It's being written <coughs> to a church. And what is the church? The church is the body of Christ. The church is... Sure, it consists of several... A group of believers... <coughs> But it's its own entity in itself, right? Okay, it's written to the church of Jesus Christ. It's located there in Laodicea. So let's go through here. It starts off with a description of Jesus. 
Okay, and each of these letters, the description a little bit different depending on what the letter addresses. And this one starts off with, these are the words of the Amen. Okay, the Amen. Definite article, the Amen. When we say, well, where's, when we say Amen, okay, if John says something, I go, Amen. What am I doing? I am putting my stamp of approval on his truth. I'm validating the fact that what he said is true. So when Jesus says the words of the Amen, he's calling himself not only the validation of truth, the validation of God's truth, but the ultimate validation. He is the source <coughs> of truth, just like we read in John, where I am the way, the truth, the life. He's saying that I am the source of truth. And then he expands that or expounds that a little bit further when he gets into the next description is the faithful and true witness. Okay? He is the validation, the source of truth, and he is the faithful and true witness. Uh, the true witness meaning he tells the truth. You can depend on him to tell the truth. Faithful, and you, you can depend on him to be that witness. Okay? Faithful and true witness. Then in the NIV, the next phrase is the ruler of God's creation. Okay, Again, some of you might have a version that say the beginning of God's creation. We're the first among the creation. It all means the same thing. It's talking about beginning or first as priority. Okay, the most important, not of the creation, but the basically the creation revolves around him. The center of the creation. The ruler in creation, as NIV says, or uh, go to Colossians 1, chapter, Colossians 1, verse 15, says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For, for by him all things were created, things, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created in him and for him. And that's what we're being referred to here. Is that sense when he talks about the ruler of God's creation. And then he goes on and he talks about, I know your deeds. I know your works. Here, after identifying himself as the source of everything. He says, I know your works. There's more to it than the fact he knows what you did. Okay? As you read these letters, throughout the letters, when Jesus says, I know your works, he also means I know why you did it. Not only do I know what you did, but I know why you did it. Many of us have done things that we can understand the difference there. Right? How many times has someone, one of us, someone, I know I have, have done something that seems so nice. It just seems so nice for me to do that. It's so nice of you to go to go talk to that person about Christ. And then suddenly, like, yeah, I know, but he hates it when I do it, and I just love getting under his goat. Okay? Right? We, have we, am I the only one that's done something stupid like that? Christ is saying, I know your works. Not only do I know what you do, but I know why you do it. I know why you do it. Then we go on. It starts getting a little bit confusing. It gets hard here, guys. It says, I know your deeds. That you're neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you are either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. <clears throat> uh, literally, at the end there, it says spit out of the mouth. That's a polite way of saying I'm about to vomit you. Okay, I'm going to vomit you out. What does that mean, cold or hot? You know, for years I was taught and believed that what Christ was saying was, you know, since you're lukewarm, you're not hot. Well, hot must be good, cold must be bad, right? So, you're not hot. 
what Christ is saying, rather you be hot, that you really, really believed in me, or cold, you just didn't believe in me at all. It just didn't make sense. Or maybe it referred to passion. I'd rather you be hot, very, very passionate about me, or cold, very apathetic about me. That doesn't make sense either. I really, really struggled with this. And it comes back to, in order to understand this, we really have to understand and use all of our context that we have. A lot of it I mentioned at the beginning. Laodicea, I said, we're going to talk about it didn't have any water supply. Laodicea does not have any water supply. It's situated between a town called Heropolis, if that means anything to anybody. Okay, if not, just, just say, whoo, he can pronounce it, okay? I <laughs> practice that one, Sandy, okay? <clears throat> so Heropolis. And then down below Laodicea to the south is Colossae. We all know about that city. That's where the book of Colossians I just read to, read from. That's where that letter was written, which is Colossae. Now, what we have here in Colossae, they're famous for having this cold spring, this uh, spring, uh, water spring, a fresh water spring. In fact, to this day, Colossae doesn't exist anymore. But if you go there, the, you can still drink from that spring, from that spring well, a nice, cold, fresh, clean-tasting water. Up in Herobolus, they're well known for having hot springs. Okay, they have these mineral hot baths up there that they were used to make healing balms. They used it as a medical treatment, this medical or a mineral hot spring. They got laid a sea right in the center of it. There's one river that runs through that dries up eight months of the year. So they can't count on that. So what do they do? <clears throat> they have to pipe the water in. Okay, they pipe it in through these big three-foot diameter aqueducts made out of stone, these stone pipes. And by the time the water flows all the way 10 miles, it's no longer that cold water that starts out as. What is it? It's lukewarm. It's lukewarm. And not only that, but it's just gone through these stone pipes. Okay, and it's picked up all kinds of mineral deposits and calcium as it goes through. So it's a very mineral laden. It's full of uh, calcium carbonate. That means, does that mean anything to anybody? Alka Seltzer. Okay? Can you imagine drinking a warm glass of Alka Seltzer? Yeah. Oh, I can't either. What, what would happen? It's vomit inducing. Okay? So what Christ is saying here, he said, you're not cold and refreshing. You're not that cold drink of water, that refreshing, healing drink of water. Nor are you the, you're the hot medical treatment. You're not healing like these hot waters. You're neither one. In fact, you are just as, just as bad, just as disgusting as your own water supply. That's what Christ is saying. He said, you are just as disgusting as that vomit-inducing water you drink. Okay? And the people in Laodicea would have known exactly what that meant. <laughs> they have to drink this water. Okay? They would have known exactly what Christ meant there. So you're just as disgusting as that water. <laughs> That farmer sued water isn't bad. I, I, I'm not going to go there, John. I thought about that all week. You know, I'm not. You know, I don't want to go there. I may insult the mayor or something. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't listen to the recording. I don't listen to the recording. Okay, so Christ is saying, you are disgusting to me. You are disgusting. You're vomit-inducing. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Now let's think about this for a moment. Of all the churches, of all these seven letters that get written, doesn't that seem like a rather harsh sentence for Christ to say, you are absolutely disgusting. You make me, you make me sick. If you read through these other letters, these other churches, we've got churches in there that are involved that have uh, brought sexual immorality, uh, temple prostitution into the church. 
There's churches listening here that uh, have idolatry worship. Churches that have compromised with the trade guilds. I didn't say unions. But has compromised with the trade guilds to the point that they have their people participating in temple worship and, again, temple prostitution in order to get a job. There are churches in these seven letters that are doing some terrible stuff. You know, we have this one that's lukewarm. It's getting this harsh, harsh judgment from Christ. So you have to ask yourself, why? Why is that? And I think the answer comes in the next paragraphs or the next verses where Christ starts talking about a contrast between the way Laodicea views itself and the way Christ views Laodicea. And I was going to pick that up in verse 17. Christ says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Let's stop there for a second. I told you Laodicea is very wealthy. Right? We we'll give you a the story here about how wealthy they were. Back in 1869, there was a huge earthquake in the region, and all the cities in the area, I'd be quiet over there. Mom, <laughs> <laughs> quit causing trouble. And so all the cities in the area were just devastated by this earthquake. Well, Rome has their own version of FEMA, okay? And so Rome sends all this money to all these cities to help rebuild and to help recover from this earthquake, Laodicea sent the money back. Okay? They sent the money back to Rome saying, we got our own money, we can handle this. Okay? Now it wasn't a nice, polite, you know, gee, we really appreciate the offer, but we were able to take care of it ourselves. Here's the money back, we'll go give it to someone else who needs it. Okay? No, this was more of a we don't need your stinking money, Rome. Get off our backs. Okay? It was a very prideful, very bitter statement that we don't need your help. We don't want your help. Take your money back. But that's, that's the mindset at Laodicea. Very self-centered. Very self-dependent. Oh. mindset. Okay? We don't need your money. We don't need your money. Take it back. Let me read this verse again. Verse 17, Jesus says, You say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. Sound familiar? Church is taking on the same attitude as the city. Christ continues to say, But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So you're laying to see a thing saying, we're rich. We're rich. We don't need any help. We don't need a thing. We acquired great wealth. But Christ says, no. You're wretched. You're wretched. Several meanings, basically, to, to pronounce as unhappy or miserable, to be miserable. Okay, so you're miserable. Pitiful means you're the object of pity. And the only emotion people can work up when they look at it is just pity for you. And that must sound real good with the prideful lay of sins. You're poor. That word poor actually means the lowest level of poverty. Okay, that's way down there. You're blind. Now that, that's going to be particularly hard for people to lay a seed to sit with. The other thing lay a seed had going for it, they had this big medical complex. And what did they make at this medical complex? Remember the, the mineral, hot mineral springs? They took the minerals out of that and they made an eye salve. This eye ointment to put the eyes to cure all these eye diseases. This is the other thing they're famous for. Christ says, no, you're blind. And you're naked. You're naked. The other thing, industry that Laodicea had was they made this black, silk, or glossy wool. They didn't make it. The sheep sort of made it, I guess. 
They processed it. It has a, a shiny black wool. And Christ says, no, you're naked. The word naked there, we can all understand it. To be naked, not only is that shameful here in public, but to be naked before God. God sees everything about us. He knows the truth. So let's read that again, verse 17. You say, I am rich. I have acquired great wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Christ is just highlighting how they think they can do it themselves. We have everything. We're rich. Jesus will call you when we need help. And that's the attitude. That is what Christ is calling this vomit-inducing lukewarmness that he's so disgusted about. It's that attitude. We're rich, Christ. We, we got it. We got it handled. When we need help, we'll give you a call. That's the attitude. So what does Christ say to do about it? Christ says, says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fly in the flyer, gold refined in the fire, <clears throat> so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes, so you can see. The white clothes to be wear, I think we can all recognize and associate that with, with the white robe, the white robes, white garments that were given that it talks about later in Revelation. It's a symbol of the righteousness of Christ applied to us. And how that covers that nakedness and bareness before God. And it covers the shameful nakedness. And then sad on your eyes. Like I said, that's one of the things Laodicea made. And you hear Christ say, no, get it from me. What is Christ saying? Is Christ saying that gold is bad? It's bad to be rich? Is Christ saying these fancy clothes are bad? No, Christ is pointing out, get it from me. At least, at least recognize it came from me in it to begin with. I mean, I am the ruler of the creation, the first of the creation. Everything was created by me and for me. At least recognize it. That's what Christ is saying. <clears throat> and then Christ provides a solution. It's right there in verse 19. It says, Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Now notice here, Christ does not say that I punish and destroy. He says, I rebuke and discipline. He doesn't say it's going to be enjoyable, okay? but it's discipline. It's a fatherly thing. It's, it's something done in love, like you would discipline your child. Okay? It's not talking about punishment and destroying you. It says, so be earnest and repent. In the verse most of us are familiar with, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Now, many of us are familiar with that verse. In fact, we probably read it on 50% of the little tracks that you see, right? And that's fine. That's what the words talk about. Okay? But if you put it in context, there's just so much more there. Put this in context. Christ, recall, is writing this to the church. He's not writing it to unbelievers. So it's not so much an evangelistic concept he's looking at. He's talking to believers in, a church, in his church, his bride. Okay? He's talking to them. Let's sort of pick this out. Let's see more than just evangelism. For one thing, Christ stands at the door and knocks. If you're knocking on the door, which side are you on? The outside, right? But this is Christ's church. He's saying that he's outside the door knocking. The church has literally kicked him out. <coughs> they only kicked him out. So they don't even go on out there. We'll call you when we need you. So Christ is saying, I'm standing outside the church knocking to get in. 
The other thing I want you to notice here is Christ has come to us. Christ has come to the church. Okay? Here, look at it as a doctor. The doctor says, this is the problem. This is your diagnosis. This is the treatment you need. And then he comes and makes the house call. So he's there to provide that treatment for us. Now, if you're talking, especially if you're talking about a church that's self-dependent and everything they do is them, 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 you're not going to wait for them to come to you. <coughs> okay, Christ comes to us. He comes to us, the church. <clears throat> it's sort of like Jesus is saying, you are improperly connected to me. You are not connected to the source. I'm the source and you're improperly connected to me. And because of that, you're lukewarm. Because of that, you are just as disgusting as your own water supply. And you have become deceived. Since you're not part of that source, you become deceived and you deceive yourselves to the point that you're blind. You don't even recognize how disgusting you are. You don't recognize how poor you are. You don't recognize the fact that you're miserable and pitiful. You don't even see your own nakedness before God. And we say, oh, Jesus, I'm sorry, I repent. Here I come. <laughs> what do you mean here you come? I'm already there. Okay, he's saying, I come to the door. I stand at the door and knock. So how are we doing with this? <coughs> See, the church in Laodicea is at a huge disadvantage. They're at a huge disadvantage. One, <clears throat> They're not being physically persecuted like the other churches. When they go to church, they don't have to worry about someone barring the door shut and catching the church on fire. Okay, they're not being physically persecuted. They live in an area that has a very relatively... Yeah, I'll get to the economy later. They live in an area that has a strong industrial base. Okay, They live in an area that... They don't have to worry about finding, you know, they, they don't worry about which doctors. They've got their own doctors. They've got a nice, strong medical supply. Medicine's there when you need it. I'll go back to the economy and say a relatively stable economy. Okay. So they don't have to worry about that. They don't have to call on God until they need Him. They have a huge disadvantage there. How are we doing? How are we doing? Do we suffer from the same vomit-inducing lukewarmness? This self-centeredness? Or should I say, how do we suffer from this? How does that impact us? When was the last time any of you knew any of you just absolutely knew that God was the only way you were going to make it through the day? How many of you woke up in the morning not even knowing if you were going to make it through the day? <clears throat> the vast majority of the Christians in the world today have to face those decisions every day. Every day. You know, the Christian church is growing faster in China, where they have to meet underground because they're worried about the doors being locked and the church burned. The latest, he was at a disadvantage, and we're at a disadvantage there too. So, how does that look for us? How does that look for us? Do we suffer from that? What about in our prayer life? Do we suffer from that in our prayer life? How many times have we, how many times have we said the prayer, oh God, please give me the strength to overcome this temptation. Right? But didn't Jesus teach us to pray, lead me not to temptation, deliver me from evil? We are so deep in this self-centeredness, this self-dependentness, that even when we pray, we limit God to helping us instead of doing it for us. What about in our scripture readings? 
What about how we understand the Bible? Do we put ourselves in the middle of it? The story of David and Goliath. Everyone know that story? Right? And it teaches that be like David and trust in God how to face your giants, right? Well, that's the way we read it. Who's that story about? Us. Put Christ in the center of that story. That is a beautiful story. It's all it's a true story. It's a true story where God has played out the story of his son Christ, the real David. Okay, let's look at it. David was had already been anointed king okay, as a young boy. So here we have God's anointed king steps up to the battlefield as the champion for Israel. And single-handedly does what all of them combined couldn't do. Okay, so God is living out the story of his son in the story of David. Let's put Christ back into the center of our scriptures too. Now I'm not saying that the other reading is wrong. I'm just saying it's not complete. Okay? So let's put Christ back in the... If we're going to put ourselves in that story, let's at least be honest and make ourselves are the Israelites cowarding in the corner wetting our pants. Okay? Let's not put ourselves as the hero. What about recognizing God as <clears throat> the source of everything we get? Not only the source of everything we need, but what about everything we've already received? Everything we've already received. I think it's very important. I think it's important that we recognize that both as individuals and as a church, we have a desperate need to be shown with a desperate need and the fact that we can't get there without Him. The fact that we need Him to do it for us. We need Him as our source more than we need him as a helper. Okay? And Miss B, I'm sorry, but I can't even remember what you said at Sunday school that I said I was going to quote you with. <laughs> so just, just take my word for it. Miss B has some words of wisdom. And my brain didn't hold on. Well, we were talking about, I said, well, we're going to run out of missionaries to send overseas. And then I said, uh, no. Uh, the Lord don't need my, my help. He'll take care of it himself. Yeah. There you go. The Lord don't need our help. He'll take care of it himself. So if we, as we look here, and I hope some people are a bit uneasy. A bit uneasy because they realize that they, as individuals, we all suffer from this problem. Okay, and as I look around, we got the leaders in the church sitting here today. Remember, this letter is being written to the church as well as individuals. So, what about the church? It's the church has yeah, some course corrections to make also. So, I hope everyone has been unsettled with that. But I want you to go back to verses 19 and 20. And actually, 19 through the end. It says, Those whom I love. I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. It's such a beautiful picture of fellowship. Tender fellowship. Continue on verse 21. To him who overcomes... I will give the right to sit with me on my <coughs> throne just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So let's back up. Verse 21. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. And you say, how can I possibly overcome? How can I even ask the question, how can I overcome after I stood up here for 30 minutes talking about getting rid of the word I? It's right there in that next sentence. Jesus says, As I overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. So Jesus is saying, How do you overcome? 
you overcome by accepting the fact that I already overcame for you. Then you can sit on my throne just as I sit on my Father's throne. Do you bow with me, please? Father, we come to you just with thanks for your word. And we come to you with hopefully some uneasy thoughts, some guilt. And Father, we also come to you with re in repentance. Come to you in repentance and just look forward to accepting to accepting that gift of you establish you just providing us with that I overcame that you have overcome for us. Father, I pray you be with each of us as we continue on through our week. I also want to ask for your hand of protection over everyone involved in the parade today. all this in the name of Jesus Christ. They are piano players back then. Mm -hmm. We want us to turn to How about Kaz from here? Can you put that up for me?